Across Global, sparking innovative thoughts. Hello, welcome to another episode of Texas Global Podcast. I'm Chawa Rakyong Tiranon Arpupe, the global content editor for Texas Media. Now, from early 2020 to now early 2021, the main concern for a lot of people has now been and always or maybe will be how to survive in a very changing world, a very changing environment uh, where people have been laid off, people have been furloughed, uh, and companies have had to change their business plans. Today, we're going to talk about the future of work. Where do you go now? (laughs) And uh, we're very lucky indeed to have with us on our program today, Marvin Lau. He's an investor, he's an operator, executive executive coach, conference keynote speaker, opinions uh, of that that has been analyzed, that has been insightful, everywhere around the world. He's also had a a, a massive experience in the Silicon Valley with Yahoo and other companies. Hello. Hi, how are you? (laughs) (laughs) I had a mouthful to say. That was a lot. That was a lot. I mean, you've got a lot. I I can't, I can't do you justice. So I'm going to let you, um, you know, maybe introduce yourself a little bit. Maybe something I left out for our viewers and listeners uh, about who you are, Marvin. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for having me. And so um, I'll do a quick intro. I'll be super, super fast. So uh, my name is Marvin Liao. I have spent now 21 years in the tech industry. So, you know, did start for a couple of years. I uh, was a corporate executive at Yahoo for many years, growing a lot of the international businesses, um, did some angel investing, joined a lot of boards, still sit on a lot of boards and advisory boards, uh, was most recently a partner at 500 Startups. So I ran and started the San Francisco office as an investor and, and invested in over 414 seed and pre-seed companies across the globe. Um, and then I left 500 end of 2019. And last year um, was original plan was to do angel investing and just kind of like do the conference circuit and kind of COVID kind of blew that, uh, that up. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, you know, like that's a, like, that's a champagne problem. Right. So, you know, like I'm, I'm, I've said I'm very fortunate to sort of like sort of not have to really do anything. So, um, you know, in last, I just recently joined like the board of, um, of a gaming company um, based in central Eastern Europe. Um, I advise a bunch of family offices, um, and I also uh, mentor a lot of different startup accelerators, and I also look at investing myself. So I, I invest my own portfolio in um, you know public stocks and in crypto, and what else I do? Yeah, I do some oh, that's a lot. executive coaching, and yeah, I, I mean just like I keep myself busy, right? So since last year, just been, um, and I, I I actually advise and sit on several investment committees of of several new VC funds um, across the globe. So I, I keep busy. Oh, it's, it's, it's actually a very good thing because everyone, yeah. uh, you know, I, I've listened to your talk and everything. It seems to be the key to be, being successful. I mean, being busy, but also being smart about it as well. Um, talking about one of your uh, talks before COVID-19 hit, you know, you were, you know, had that plan to go around the world and talk about your ideas. You are a very special guest at our own summit, yeah. our global summit, that was awesome. Global I loved summit it. in 2019. To <laughs> the topic back then was getting ahead in a shifting landscape, job landscape. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, of course, no one anticipated 2020 and now 2021 to be like mm-hmm. what it is now. How, how do we get ahead in an environment that is rapidly changing all the time? Yeah, I mean, I think that the first thing that you have to do is sort of like, yeah, that, that's a tough question. I think sort of it comes down to, so if you think about sort of like the the two main skills that I think anybody should have right now, it's like resilience and like flexibility, right? Because you just, I had, you know, like everybody. So, you, you know, and I think I feel like in Silicon Valley, sort of like you have this because there's this term called clock speed, right? Of just like how fast stuff changes. And so certain industries, for example, like if you're in the microchip industry or your software, like the clock speed is very, very fast. Like you just have to iterate very, very quickly because the whole goal is to learn as quickly as possible right um, versus say for example the automotive industry right like if you're planning and making a car like that's like 
one, two years out, like this, like the, the clock speed is much longer. But I think what you're seeing is just the world is becoming for better, for worse. I don't have a strong opinion either way. It, it's clock speed is increasing in almost every single industry in every single space in every single country, right? If you, if you think about that. Yeah. Um, and, and in some ways, that's actually good because like you get feet, you try a lot of things and you get feedback. And so I think the big, the first thing is actually really the mindset and the mental attitude. And, and this is something I've only, I, I feel like I've learned, I've done, but I've only learned sort of like consciously of this, this mentality of just like being willing to try a lot of different things. And, and there's always this idea of like being wrong. And I'm like, the, the idea is just you want to try a lot of things and have a mindset of sort of like win or learn, right? Because like either way, it's sort of like, even if it doesn't work out, you sort of learn a bunch of stuff versus so that you try something, it doesn't work out. And you're like, you kick yourself and you're like, this sucks. I wasted my time. And so I think you have to have that mindset shift, right? So that that's number one. And just sort of, it's, it's really have to have the mindset shift you know, five-year plans, like you want to have a plan, but be prepared. That's probably going to change yeah. whether you're a startup founder or business yeah. owner yourself. Yeah. I'm just like, people ask me like, what's your five-year plan? Like, what's your five-year plan? I'm like, I have no five-year plan. Like I have certain <laughs> principles and things of it just like who thought, like, if you, if you think about what happened with COVID, it just like, it sped up. And you've heard this many times, like COVID sped up a lot of trends that were already happening, right? Like just like yeah. a lot of stuff that used to be mainly offline has moved you know, sort of mainly offline has moved online now, right? Like the digitization of the world and digitization of companies and things is just like really, really accelerated a lot. It was going to, ha- it was happening already though, right? Yeah. Just now the clock speed is just increased. Yeah. And, and I think one of the interesting things that you pointed out that is, you know, the change of mindset um, and, and it's a really big shift. And a lot of people are focused on technology, but really at the same time, you have to think that, Everyone, every person needs to kind of up their game in, in having a more mature mindset and, and being more, uh, having more tougher, a tougher mindset to deal with what's happening around them right now. Um, what, but uh, getting to the digital issue here before we go deep into the mindset, yeah. Um, yeah. the obvious thing is uh, artificial intelligence or AI. Um, there have been different uh, reactions. Those who say that people can adapt, you know, they, they're very positive. You can get higher level jobs. You can work, you can integrate yourself with, you know, AI. Well, yeah. you know, the majority of people are worried. They're worried about how it's going to impact their job, no matter how many times or how many ways people have been addressing and talking about this in each talk or seminar. Um, what is your say in this issue? So I think, short term, I think it's going to be really bad. And so the, the, the reality AI is, is, is really like, it's, it's, it eats people software, right? AI software, like ultimately these things eat jobs, they eat people. Um, but at the same time, you know, depend, and so it depends on, on what angle you look at. I think they, I, I actually think like technology is neutral, right? Like it does good. It does bad. All, all technology is neutral, right? Like AI is neutral. Biotech is neutral. It can be used for good. It can, use for bad, it can be used for sort of evil. But, you know, I think like what ends up happening, if you look at sort of any major technological innovation or any technological wave, you know, in the beginning, it's really, really awful because, like, you know, with say uh, manufacturing, like back in the day, right? Like sort of like um, you know, the industrial age of, of sort of industrial technologies, there was a lot of job destruct- destruction, but it, it actually probably need to happen in the long run there were a lot more new jobs created during that time i think the same thing is going to happen with sort of like software ai automation or whatever and if you, if you look at a lot of the jobs that are being done frankly speaking i don't know if they should be done by humans right oh. like there's a there's a like like for example like mining jobs like i think robots should be doing that i don't know if humans should be going down in mines like it's literally like 18th is mining has not changed that much. Like it's changed in certain with certain technology, but still you're still sending human beings down there. That stuff should be done by robots, right? Or yeah. um, you know, hamburger, you know, flipping hamburgers and things, you know, like a McDonald's. Like I did a job at Burger King. It's an awful job. In some ways, that's actually good for people, like you know, to have I would love my daughter to go work at Burger King for a while and just realize how hard it is to make money because you know that was yeah. helpful. But I'm not sure people should be doing those type of jobs, right? Or bank teller jobs. We're like that can easily be done by. So there's certain jobs. I think there's going to be some initial. Jo- there's going to be a lot of job destruction. But I, if if you look at what's happening in chess, this idea of you know computer versus sort of like people, the computer wins. But then what they're seeing now is just like computer with human, um, there's really interesting permutations that are coming about. And so mm. computer with human actually beats computer only. Mm. Wow, that's very interesting. 
Um, with COVID-19, as we said, it's accelerated a lot of things. Um, and when you talk about AI then, um, what specifically, what kind of AI do you think has been accelerated very fast in this past year? Um, and you've talked about earlier, just in your talk there about jobs being replaced, but what are the main jobs do you think that will be eaten up right away? Um, I mean, the, the, I think the early, I don't think we're there yet. So I think the, the reality is of, of AI where if you look at a lot of technology trends, like they kind of creep and creep and creep and all of a sudden it hits like critical mass. I don't think we're anywhere close to critical mass, right? So it's like the, the lily pad like doubles every sort of like, you know, like one day there's one, next day there's two, next day there's four. It's sort of like, it kind of creeps up, you know, all of a sudden the, the, the pond is full of lily pads, right? It's the same thing with technology where it's, the stuff just sort of takes a while. And I still think it's early days. So I don't think we've seen the job destruction. Like in some ways like we know it's going to happen. I think it's probably like five to 10 years out. I don't think it's like, you know, next year. And so the reality is I haven't seen like a, a speed up of that. I've seen sort of like more of the movement of say, for example, like, offline commerce, you know, so offline commerce to online commerce, I've seen a speed up of that. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to it, I've seen sort of like a movement of sort of like, you know, from offices to Zoom calls, right? I've seen sort of this movement of sort of offline to, to online. I haven't seen sort of like dramatic use. I see a lot more investment going to robotics and software in general, but I haven't seen that job destruction yet that's come specific from AI. A lot of the job destruction is just really coming back from government mandated lockdown. So I haven't, you know, I, 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 mm -hmm. I haven't seen that yet. Do you, yes, in your talk in 2019, you're talking about Muji as an example, a case study where, um, you know, factories have yeah, the dark, yeah, the dark factories, right? Uh, yeah, dark like factories. Um, and, you know, COVID-19 has, you know, sh shut down a lot of production for some companies with outbreaks and everything. Do you see a move towards that kind of manufacturing now? Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. <laughs> um, I, and I'm also seeing a lot of like, a lot of implementation. Amazon has been pretty far ahead of, of implementation of using like robots and warehouses, right? Like automating certain, some of the processes, not all of them. There aren't, right now, I don't think we're, we're in a place where just like for logistics of completely removing humans from it yet, but directly that's where it's going. And you're seeing that also the, for example, like automation of factories in, in China, that's moving very, very quickly in China. China, I think it's like, I think one of the fastest growing Going second, or it's, I don't know if it's the first or second. I think it's second for sure. Second, mm. sort of like biggest buyer of robotics, um, and so you're seeing that because of the cost of of labor has gone up. So they're really investing a lot into into robots. So then, you know, what do you, how do you deal with that shift for humans? You know, you said that in the past we've had the industrial revolution, we've had different changes in how people work, and and we have survived. But a lot of these things that we're talking about, one of the main reasons why we are not there at that point where you know AI or uh, robots have taken over jobs is because there's that human aspect of it. There's the unions. There's those people yeah. who are like you know, you, there is a sense of responsibility for society for this shift. How do you think that's going to come about? Um, I think like there, there's two key things that are really, really critical. I think there's an education retraining piece, right? Like if you get knocked out because of technology, like there should be, and, and companies are not going to do that. They, that's not in the mandate for better, for worse. But I do think sort of, for example, that is where government is really, really important, right? So there's the, the, the education retraining piece. I also think there's the, the UBI piece of this, you know, sort of like the universal basic income. Um, I do think there has to be some transitionary thing because you can't throw people out on the streets, right? We, as we talked about earlier, Year before this, like this is what leads to revolutions. Um, you know, we've already have massive social inequality. This is only going to exacerbate it. So we can't just throw them out. That that's that you know, like it's just number one. It's just wrong, right? On many many fronts. <laughs> um, but also sort of like. Yeah, just like just I don't think society can manage that, right? Society ultimately, if you think about this, this book is called the four the four four levelers. I read this book a long time ago and talked about the there's really only four ways that we've seen human societies actually overcome or, or at least the four results of, of inequality, right? Like just when you have like societies that have massive inequality, they either end up in revolution or they get solved by war, right? Or they get solved by famine. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. that's, that's what happened in, in Europe or, um, you know, like basically like massive government intervention and taxation, right? Like those have been the only times that's actually happened. That's what happened in the U.S. in the 30s. So is there going to be a big problem? We already have a problem, but is it going to get larger in terms of digital or educational inequality in the world? 
Oh, it's, it's, I mean, I can only speak about the U.S., right, which I think is China and the U.S. Are, are two of the biggest like dystopian nightmares of countries, two of the most competitive, but arguably two of the most dystopian countries. Because if you take a look at the U.S., like the average American student coming out of university has like something like 36 or $37,000 in student debt, which is crazy, right? And so that's yeah. why they get pushed certain sort of like incomes and and also what they find out is just like a lot of them come out with debt and you can, they can't get jobs and and so that's a problem so you have you have a lot of that happening um I, in some cases even higher right like the the debt rates and so you know it is a problem like china too has massive massive issues like there's a reason why china has become so bellicose towards sort of like the external world right now because they're i think that they have a lot of potential unemployment issues and things right now. There's demographic issues, unemployment issues, or some, there's some stuff that's going on over there. That's why you start pointing towards sort of external enemies to unify the people against the outside, right? Like that's a very common thing that, you know, both democratic and authoritarian regimes do. Like, yeah. look at the enemy, ignore all this stuff, look, yeah. look out there, right? They're, they're, these, look at these bad people. And so I think like China has a lot of issues because like you're seeing a lot of like, there's a lot of growing inequality in China and US has been a disaster. Like there really is in the US and across the globe of just like this K-shaped recovery. So people have jobs like white collar jobs, engineers, these type of folks, they can work from home. Their cost structure has gone down, but they're still making money. They're doing fine. They can order their stuff from Amazon and get shipped to them. Groceries come from Instacart. Like they don't have to leave the house. Everybody else, service workers, the small business owners, like they've, there's a government mandated shutdown. What do you do, right? Yeah. Like, what do you do? Um, and so I, there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of anger. And I, I think like you saw the results of that in the US, like just as of January, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, January 6th, what a disaster. Um, and so, and I think there's, that's an education issue, the social inequality issue. Um, and also just like, like a lot of these things, like a lot of the violence and stuff that happened, at least in the US, um, I think that's going to be happening across the globe has been really exacerbated by COVID. You know, right? the because- thing, yeah, yeah, it's definitely. And, and it's, it's really changed. And going back to a, a point that you said, uh, education, um, what you and I are other older people, when we were, you know, young, you know, our perspective of school and university was like, it's probably very drastically different to what it is now. I mean, when you were a student, you're like, I want to get into the top universities, I want to get into the top school, I want to get in a, uh, have a secure job with a big corporation, I want to get promoted and everything. Um, But now it's it's different. And you yourself, you are a father. Um, What do you think is then the next thing for or how will the educational path be for the future generation? You know, I I think what's going to happen is, you know, you're from with like those income sharing agreements. I mean, the biggest issue for a lot of schools right now is just like the incentives are just completely out of line. So I I love the fact that there's sort of like this is more of a win win, right? Like we don't get paid until like literally you get paid. And so making sure that if we're generating, we're not you know, sort of like placing you when we're not generating sort of like the skill sets and, tra- you know, training you in the way that will get you employed, we don't get paid either. And so there's, there's some, there's massive incentive misalignment right now in a lot of schools, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I also think what is being taught in school is more or less useless, right? Like, and I also <laughs> think something about like, and this is just university, this is even like elementary school, like some, somewhere along the lines, like, if you think back, like, I, I look at my daughter, and in some ways, actually, like, like, her missing sort of like from March onwards through to June was actually a good thing. Like Zoom school is not great. So I, I think not having a socialization piece was, was not good. But the thing that actually came back was that her love of, of learning actually came back. So she's like, I'm interested in this. I'm going to go just check YouTube. And, mm-hmm. and I think something, something about sort of the school system right now just drums out the creativity and drums out the fun of learning. Um, and, and this idea of going to university where I, you know, I was very, very lucky going to school in Canada, not the U S and, and, um, I took classes I, that I, that interested me. Um, and I didn't take business, right. I took history. And, and yeah. what I realized, what I realized, it's like a lot of stuff that, that they, they teach you on number one, drumming out the lack of sort of like, like everything I talked about is change of mindset. Like, but the biggest thing is actually like not drumming out your curiosity, like, like you should pursue sort of like what is interesting for you, not this follow your passion BS, but like this idea of just like really like stuff that's interesting for you because there's like so much opportunity out there and being sort of like going and just like learning yourself where the way stuff is taught in school, most of them are garbage, right? Like just it's yes. not taught in a very fun or interesting way. And so I, I look at all the stuff that's happening with like, you know, teachable 
um, a lot of like YouTube, like you, you learn a ton of stuff from YouTube, right? You want, you want to learn facts and things and it's just done way better or you know like there's there's so many new ways of like udemy like a big fan of udemy like there's just so many creative calling right like just like there's tons you know it's a creative studio creative live actually creative live like there's great classes of creative live or master class like there's tons of these like platforms and a lot of universities also have their their classes their courses actually online through um what's the name of it like just like there's tons of programs um, there's so many programs there's so many um, programs you know, out there. Ivy, Ivy schools are coming out with programs as well. Um, and But at, at the same time, I just want, I think it is also interesting that there will have to be some sort of a change, definitely a shift in, in educational institutes um, because, you know, the internet is, is kind of like the wild west. <laughs> I mean, you can get a lot, but then you have to have a filter kind of, right, with, with all the content that you're learning or, or you're, yeah, you're yeah, just, and, you know, the fake I, news and everything, right? How, how do you think um, there could be a compromise or a way to integrate that sort of freedom to learn online, but also have that, um, you know, the formal institute play a role as well? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, right? So, you know, what is interesting is I, I actually think like all the top universities in the world have nothing to worry about, right? Like there's always, somebody's always going to want to have a credential and they're top universities for good reason, right? Like, because they have the the deep concentration of, of usually great professors and, and just the brand name and things. I think everybody else can get wiped out, right? So, so I think that's, that's my hypothesis, what's going to happen. But I, I think like, if you look at what's happening, like, you know, using Silicon Valley as sort of barometer, like Google and other places, like we don't, we don't care if you have a bachelor's degree anymore, like just things are changing, right? Because if you're a software engineer, I just, it's just easier to go look at your GitHub code, right? Like I can tell versus, <laughs> well, I don't, I don't care if you went to Stanford, um, you know, like going to sort of like Stanford, um, you know, sort of like computer science, like it's, less you know it may not be as helpful as a guide versus sort of what you're programmed or what you built um and you can go and look at the code and go okay yeah you did this and i also think the other thing that's actually happening is just like a lot of the tools like you know technology democratizes so you, you've heard this rise of this no you know the no code or low code where just a lot of the stuff that you the really really challenging program just kind of disappeared and abstracted in the back where anybody like myself who's not technical can just like make stuff now um, and so I yeah. think you're seeing more of that. And so I think this idea of just like this formalization of education, the reality is I think a lot of people can get by. Like, I, I do think there's a lot to be said about, like, it's not necessarily just sort of like going and getting sort of like white collar jobs. Like, I think trade schools are just are totally fine. Like, if you look at Germany, like trade schools are seen as very honorable. And in some ways, you actually make way more money as a plumber than in some cases, like a white collar white collar job and probably work a lot less. Yeah. Um, so there's something about that and have a great lifestyle. Right. So <laughs> I think there's, there's, there's change of foot, you know, with these ISAs. I also think sort of what's happening, just like self-learning. Um, I think you're seeing a lot of people now, like really, really jump, especially young kids these days are just like so much more entrepreneurial. And so Ooh. for a lot of them, they're like, why do I even need to go to school? Right. Like I can just <laughs> learn this stuff myself or um, I took an incredible class that I strongly recommend. So, you know, when you're yeah. locked in, I, yeah. I took a class called, um, you know, rite of passage about like online writing and it was a cohort driven class. Um, and it was amazing. Guy named David Perel, young guy, right? Like he's like 27, 28, like brilliant guy with a team. And it's like a cohort driven writing class. And you jump on the call, you know, with like this group and there's a, there's a session, there's all these like small, you break out in these groups and it's like three sessions a week. Um, and I did that for like, I think, how long was that? Like two months? It was one of the best things I've ever done. It wasn't cheap for the record, oh, but it was, yeah. it was a really good class I've been recommending to everybody where like, I actually think like there's some skill sets you just have to know. And I think writing is one of them, like writing online, I think is a, yeah. is going to be a very critical skill in general, not the writing crap that you learn in school. It's just like, that stuff's useless. Yeah. There's different styles. Um, I mean, bless my teachers in the past, yeah. but you know, here in Texas, we write a lot as well. And the writing style is very definitely different. Um, you know, um, but um I, I just want to, I, I'm curious in, in one of the points and uh, just a little bit further on how technology yeah. will be in education. Um, there has been, I've talked to a lot of people about how we can integrate technology, you know, into schools, into institutes, because uh, it's always changing very fast. So you have to play that game of balance of how do you you know get that knowledge into the classroom in time for students to actually leverage from it when they yeah. you know graduate um but at the same time do you think everyone's going to end up to be like oh 
a coder or, or like, I mean, I, how important is it to be, uh, you know, a techie, let's just say, because not everyone is, yeah. you know. I, I'm not. Yeah, a, for the record, I'm not. expert in tech, right? Yeah, and as yeah. you said, it, one of the biggest skills is like creativity, writing and everything. But at the same time, we can't ignore the fact that we do have to have a certain amount of technology. How is that going to go together? Um, I mean, here's one of the great things about people, right, in general, if, if you're from the sort of like, like biology in general, right, and ecosystems of just like ecosystems thrive when there's just like massive diversity in the ecosystem, right, of diversity of species, like even within species as well, too, very, very important for resilience and for, for the ecosystems to thrive. And so, number one, I don't think it's healthy if just like everyone goes and says, you just have to study STEM um, and then you or you just be a programmer, like number one. I actually think like where, where programs going, like you're always going to need elite programmers, but the reality is that programmers are slowly going to become less and less important. This, 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 this term I use like low code and no code of a lot of this technology is going to be abstracted. And so there are going to be always elite programmers. Um, but the reality is that these programming languages are hard to keep up with, right? Like someone who's a great programmer 20 years ago, like for them to keep up with all the new sort of like programming languages are coming up is very, very hard. And there's, a lot of change like there are there are a lot of unemployed 40 year old programmers in silicon valley because of just the languages they knew they could mm. not sort of like keep up um and so i i'm not sure that's the path and i also think it's sort of like where you're naturally inclined to so you know there, there's one part which is like there's a very very sort of like pragmatic part it's like i'm gonna just get jobs that i'm gonna just you know I'm going to go get a job that's going to pay me a lot of money. I mean, that's fine. But I think the challenge with that is just sort of like what, you know, sort of you're, in some ways you're kind of skating to where the puck used to be I'm, as a Canadian, right? Like I'm using the, the, yeah. the hockey analogy when you should actually probably should be skating towards sort of like where the puck is going. And I don't know if programming is going to be like, you know, I'll give you an example. I think it'd be horrible advice to give to my daughter when I'm like, you got to be a programmer, right? Like from you're 11 <laughs> yeah. years old. It's like your parents next... saying you got to be a doctor. <laughs> yeah. Like I think doctors are in trouble too, right? Like a lot of, like there's certain, yeah. there's certain things that are just like, like by the time, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years from now, that's going to be an eternity. The world's going to be completely different, right? So I don't know if you've seen, there, there was a company called Oris that was acquired by, it was, it was acquired for I think over one or $2 billion. Like it's like a robotic surgery, right? Mm. Like just like acquired yeah. by Johnson and Johnson. I'm like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Like we're moving in that world, right? Like doctors are, there are going to be a lot less of them. There probably may not be as need as many of them. Right. And so I, I think sort of like this idea of just like, Hey, telling my daughter, like, Hey, you're going to be a programmer. Cause I, you get job security. I think this idea of getting job security out of your brain, like this term is, is it's an obsolete term. Yeah. Like, no, it I, just makes no yeah. sense. You know, no, no, I'm forced to ask the question that yeah. the team came up with. And the yeah, thing yeah. is, it's like, it's opposite of what we're talking about, yeah, how like yeah. you shouldn't really think about job security. But one of the questions that has been posted, and I think a lot of people are still asking themselves, I mean, what are the top, well, I don't want to say number, five, five fastest growing jobs in the world right now during COVID-19? I, I, I would say that I would yeah. say the five most in demand in general, like, you know, a UX specialist, right? User experience stuff, mm -hmm. because more stuff comes online, a data scientists, um, any AI specialist, because that is very hard to find, like people who really, really understand. So like artificial intelligence, I also think biotech engineers, like that's, that's also in high, high demand right now, right? Because especially like all the stuff that's going on, not just to combat the vaccine, but, you know, biotech is already very, very big to begin with. And now Ooh. you're going to see, you're going to see even more acceleration in this area. Like the next, like if I was an entrepreneur, I don't know if this is one of your questions, but if I was an entrepreneur now, like the next 10 to 20 years is going to be biotech. Like that's the space I go into because of the confluence of both software and biotech, like that is the next frontier. Space is one of them, but like, frankly speaking, you need to have some, you know, you need to alter the human, you know, the human sort of like body dramatically for to sort of thrive in space or thrive on Mars. And so this, you know, gen, you know sort of like this idea of CRISPR and things, right? Like it's, this is revolutionary. And I, I think like, any anybody who's going to the space, I think next like 20, 30 years, like this is this is where the action is going to be. Actually, I'm not an expert. Next, I, I love actually, that. I love that I, space. But actually, that was the next question. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, other other than biotech, what other sector do you think startups and entrepreneurs will be focusing on now? <laughs> I, I think what startups and, and like, I think a lot of deep tech, so climate tech stuff, you're starting to see a lot of, so like battery technology, you know, I think there's a 
deep need for that. Um, you know, besides biotech, a lot of deep tech, like climate energy. So like, you know, things like, for example, um, new, new forms of, of energy, right? Um, energy storage, I think it's going to become very, very important. Um, you know, obviously AI, there's going to be continual investment in software and AI, you know, through big companies and for consumers. Uh, what else, what else do I think is like actually quite interesting um, and actually important? Um, I mean, I, I would say those are probably like the big, you know, the really, really big spaces right now. Um, and there's a lot, oh, I, the other one is chips, right? Like microchips. That is, that is really, really important. So everyone talks about AI. And so there's a data aspect of it, but like you need compute power. And so I, I happen, you know, I'm normally in San Francisco, but you know, the reason, remember the original reason is still, you know, it used to be called Silicon Valley, it was like a microchips, right? Fairchild mm -hmm. semiconductors. If you don't have semiconductor chips, like you have nothing. So I'm in the, I am in the heartland of sort of what I would argue sort of like real center of Silicon Valley sort of semiconductors. I'm in Taiwan, right? Which has over 50% of the market share of like the best chip manufacturing and foundries in the world. The next closest country is Korea, like by a long shot, the, you know, so if you, if you, you know, for any, any sort of listeners, just like, just go and like Google Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, and you'll see how critical they are. And so, mm. for example, like they have um, boycotted, um, like they, they have put in an embargo on microchips of, of American and Western um, microchip companies sending advanced microchips to China to basically cut, you know, sort of like basically undercut their AI efforts and their technology efforts. So Huawei screwed, right? And, and yeah. actually that's also affecting, you know, if you look at sort of how important chips are, a lot of the cars that we're in are, are highly computerized. That's microchip driven. And so there are delays in Germany now of, um, of manufacturing because like they don't have enough chips to actually sort of put into their cars. Um, and that's all coming from Taiwan. Yeah, yeah and definitely. Um, th that's going to be something very interesting to see an update on. Um, coming back, to, uh, we're, we're kind of running out of time, but, but coming back to um, everybody or every, uh, every man or every woman out there. Every person, listening. every person. Every person, every person. Um, you, you know, you said something that I think is still relevant in your talk in 2019 that was like, uh, we need to stop thinking or having that employee mentality. We need to start thinking of ourselves as a business. Um, what are the essential skills that everyone needs right now to get or elevate themselves and uh, to, to go towards their goals more efficiently during this time? Uh, um, yeah, so I think number one, I think like online marketing, like that is just going to be a very, very cr critical skill. Uh, copywriting, really critical skill. Also on like writing in general, like bus good business writing, like throw out everything you learned about writing in, in school. Like that stuff's garbage, right? Nobody wants to read that. It's just like, how do you write in very simple, straightforward, effective ways? Um, and so like writing, like writing online, really, 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 really important. Um, sales skills, some basic sk sales skills. And I would say like, sort of like understanding like humans, like, you know, human psychology, social psychology, I think if you if you develop the like between like sales, online marketing, copywriting, and they're all closely intertwined, right? Um, like and and being able to sort of like start this is something I'm just trying to train myself in. It's just like starting to to adopt a lot of these like um, low code, no code tool, tools now, um, and just like trying a lot of things out. Like you know, building your own like we talked about side hustles, right? Like I think like you know, you almost have to think about sort of like your incomes in like different sort of like as a portfolio of just like having different sort of like, like even if you have a full-time job, like have side consulting projects, right? Or have side projects, have an e-commerce store. It doesn't cost you very much. It's like 50 bucks a month, maybe even 20 bucks a month. Like just, it, it doesn't cost very much to go try these things and, and tinker, right? Or build an app. Like apps are cheap to build now. Like just tinker and try a lot of things um, because sometimes these things turn, could turn into big income earners. Uh, maybe do set up a class online, you know, in something that you care about, but just like try a lot of things. I think that's what you need to have. Like there's core skill sets and those core skill sets are, are writing, online marketing and copywriting, right? And some tinkering and project management. You do that, you, you can do whatever you want. It's amazing. I think it's amazing that it's been a theme uh, I, from speaking to a lot of speakers around the world here that, you know, even though we're in a state where there is, um, you know, change in the environment, in the economy, and also more reliance on technology, the main thing that is still the main focus is human 
human interaction, human uh, needs, human empathy. Um, to end our talk, do you have any last comments? I always ask our, our guests to give a last comment to our listeners or whoever that's watching us right now on uh, what is your yeah. ultimate advice? Yeah, I, I, I have probably maybe two pieces of it. It's just like one thing you just have to understand is that, you know, there's one thing that robots can't replace. And that's sort of like, if you think about like, it's really creative things, right? Like whether it's making music, maybe it's just some people argue you can probably have robots do that. But just, I, I would say sort of like, if you think about creative, you know, so like art, right? Like, I just don't think robots can actually do that. Like, you know, software can't do that very, very well because it's missing certain things. And, and entrepreneurship is actually a human creative thing. Um, like, you know, it's just, you're basically willing it and making something, you know, creating something from nothing, right? Um, and so that's a human thing. And I actually think everyone is going to become entrepreneurial to some extent. Um, and the other thing too, is like really understanding yourself of just sort of, you know, the, your edge, how you build your edge is sort of like doing, you know, sort of doing something that you love that other people look as work, what you think is fun and other people look as work. And that's sort of want needed by the world. That is probably your edge. And that's sort of potentially you can build something around that. Okay, thank you so much, Marvin, for talking to us today. I think, you know, I definitely have been inspired. I hope our listeners have been inspired as well. And uh, it will help them start a new year yes. <laughs> with thank a fresh light. <laughs> thank yeah. you so much. Tech Sauce. Sparking innovative thoughts.